I met Stephen about maybe 10 years ago through a mutual friend because at the time I was um, trying to move career into TV and Stephen was as well so he was he was actually at Cool FM at the time and so the mutual friend was like oh you need to meet my friend Stephen he's he's a DJ but he wants to be a TV presenter and then we worked together on a pilot of a dating show actually that didn't ever go anywhere but that was that was how I got to know him people are always surprised when I say he was completely different off air than on air he was very shy incredibly shy and quite often we'd be out because we hosted a lot of events together and we'd be out doing events and people would say to me have I annoyed Stephen or you know, is Stephen okay because he would he would seem like he was in a bad mood because and it wasn't that he was in a bad mood he was just quiet because he was a quiet person when when the microphone was on and we were you know doing the show he was Mr you know and then he just went into himself again. He was really quiet, um, which a lot of people have found quite quite hard to to believe. But he was. But we were exactly the same. Him and I exactly the same off air as on. Possibly worse. Just we fought the bit out. And so after the show, we would probably spend another couple of hours together working on what we were going to do the next day, and mostly mostly fighting and annoying each other and you know winding each other up. I thought the darkness was going to make us look okay, but it doesn't. It just highlights how not okay we are. Morning! I look like a foot of squint. I'm sure I don't. No, you don't. I loved working with him. It was amazing. Because he was, he was so talented and so quick. So, so, so quick. Um, we had a feature called, well, when I say we, it was really him. It was all him. Uh, through the window. Um, which generally made fun of, you know, local politics and celebrities and people went crazy for it people used to like would, would text us or email us or whatever and say or, or when we were out and about would say whenever through the windows on I'm like how do you get away with it but also that they would sit in their car and wait until it was over sometimes it would be late into work because they would wait and other people in the car park of their work would all be sitting in their cars waiting to hear the end of it as well people loved it but what a lot of people don't know is it seemed like it was something that he would have mulled over and written down and sort of like changed words here and there. And he would, it all arrived in his brain and he would say it. So he would say to me in the morning, <clears throat> who will I do for through the window today? And I'd be like, ah, what about, uh, and name people. And he would go, right, okay. And then he would tell me to go out and make coffee because he didn't like me being there whenever he was recording it. But not, not a word was ever written down. It just... I used to say just appeared in his head and he blurted it out and that was it and his brain was like popcorn uh, in the microwave because you could see sort of like an idea appeared in his head and then it was almost like I, like I could see behind his eyes like everything just kind of and he was so fast like technically so fast at editing um, you know if somebody had phoned us or if he was working on a, like sometimes through the window he was still editing it as the kind of da, 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 da music was playing at the start, he was still working on it. He was like that fast. He was ever, he liked to do, he liked to work that way. He liked to work um, just winging it on the seat of his pants. That's the way he couldn't, he wasn't really good at preparing things. It all just, it was all just instant. It was all just spontaneous. And that, that was the real genius. I suppose I just always felt like we were always meant to work together. And we had, you know, Our paths across at that time and that wasn't the right opportunity but this was and then I always felt that we would work together again that's that's really that, that's a struggle I think just looking back and going Pop, it was so brilliant the chemistry was so good and we always knew we would work together but I just didn't expect it to end like that I saw him on the Saturday, when you know, he, he, he died sort of Monday night, Tuesday, and I, I saw him on the Saturday, and he seemed, he seemed okay. You know, he, there was nothing about that day as I, because I went to see him in Carrick Fergus, and there was nothing about that day as I left that made me think, that it didn't even enter my head for a second, that he was feeling, he wasn't feeling 100%. You know, I'm not saying he was walking on sunshine, but he was, you know, no, didn't enter my head there was anything wrong. 
it was like every breath left my body at once. I just couldn't. It just didn't seem real. Whenever I did, I had my phone off mostly because it was just non-stop, the texts, the phone calls. And then on social media, every so often I would just look and see and scroll and there was, th I'm not exaggerating, thousands of people messaging me. And I haven't read them all, but they were all from people who just couldn't, couldn't reconcile the two things. The big smile, the confidence, the fact that it looked like he had absolutely everything. He just got his dream job, the BBC, which is what he had, he had talked about for the 10 years that I'd known him, wanting to work at the BBC. And it just seemed like he had absolutely everything. To then realise, oh, that's the way he was feeling. People were so shocked. And people, the, the, the messages were things like, I've never cried for somebody that I'd never met before. Um, because he was part of their lives every day for way longer than, than I was on the show. I mean, he did that show maybe for nine years. So people went to work with him every day for that many years. And because of the nature of the show, we had to share a lot about ourselves and what was going on in our lives. So people felt they really knew him to then go, oh, hang on, what? And a lot of the messages were people asking me, why? And, you know, they would maybe say, oh, was it because of this or was it because of that? And people were just struggling to make sense, again, because it looked like he had everything. And people maybe were looking at their own lives going, well, I don't feel great, but, you know, my life isn't what his life was. So what, you know, it, it, people just couldn't, couldn't make sense of it. A lot of people just sort of appeared in my life that I didn't know before, that have now become very, very important. Um, and one of them's a guy who uh, somehow managed to talk me into cold water swimming. So I go swimming in the sea now twice a week, and even though it's freezing, and that has been, <clears throat> I, I don't even know how to explain it. It's like the last thing I ever thought I would do because I like electric blankets and being warm and, but it has, and I can't even really put into words how it helps me, but it just has, like it's just, um, I just really needed to get in the sea, it seems, yeah. And then I've, a lot of what I've been doing is, I mean, lockdown is, has, is, is awful, but one of the, the positives from it is that I, I wasn't under pressure to sort of further my career or socialize or um, really get better quickly, which before lockdown, I, I did kind of feel, you know, what, while the messages were lovely, a lot of people wanted me to say, yes, I'm okay, I'm okay. And I wasn't okay, not, I'm still not okay. Um, but it meant I had time to just be quiet and not put myself under pressure and that has really helped as well. But the other, the most important thing is I have learned to reach out to other people because I always like to be the person who's, I'm a feeder, I, like, I, I bring food to people and I like to look after people and I like to, to care for people and it was difficult for me to then relax into letting myself be cared for. And there was a lot of occasions where I had to say to people, I can't do that because I just feel awful. Or and I had, had a brain fog, really bad, like sort of feeling of just everything was fuzzy. Everything, you know, details. I was making a lot of mistakes. Um, do you know what I mean? I just things were ju just even like really simple tasks. I just hadn't got the brain power to do them. And it really helped me to be able to say to people, look, I, this is how I'm feeling and I, I can't do that. Or in a way sort of supervise me because I'm, I'm just not, I'm forgetful and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just not myself. And people looked after me and that feels really, it was hard for me to do it. But once I relaxed into it, it was the most beautiful thing that people were looking out for me. 
And I, I wish Stephen had done that. Anybody who was friends with Stephen on social media or listened to the show will know he was a really, really big advocate for mental health and for it's okay not to be okay. He would have shared helpline numbers regularly. You know, quite often that sort of does the rounds if people are, you know, if it's um, World Mental Health Day or whatever. And we hosted the Darkness Into Light Suicide Awareness Walk twice. So there was no information that he didn't have or believe about mental health and about reaching out when you don't feel okay. But he didn't do it. So, you know, in terms of sort of educating people and, you know, initiatives to educate people around um, your mental health, he knew it all. But it wasn't enough. And that really, really angers me. But there was something couldn't be said. And I think that's, not, that's what we're not tapping into. Whatever that is, we're not getting it. But also just from the message, all the messages of people saying, was it this, was it that? It's not one thing. You know, and in, in the months that I have turned this over and over in my head and spoken to people and, you know, explored this, um, we're just all so, there's just so many layers, like an onion. And it's, it's not one thing. It's never the one thing. It's, we're just much, much more complicated than, than you realize. Not long after Stephen passed, um, a friend of ours, a mutual friend of ours, Gareth, um, said, we'll set up a foundation in Stephen's name. It's really been him, it's really all Gareth Murphy. He has done this. Um, because Stephen was so, um, so caring and he would have done, he always did so much for charities. He was an ambassador for Tiny Life and he um, loved to do stuff for the, the hospice, the children's hospice and then loads of other charities. We wanted to be able to carry that on and, and do things. And, and because there was so much support for him, um, we knew people would, would support the foundation as well. So we just needed to do something positive to so that his name would always be um, remembered. And so the foundation is raising money for, for different organisations, but the money will be given to them in a, look, is there something you're doing that we can put his name on? Like, are you, is there going to be like a room, like a, like a, some sort of a playroom or something? Do you know what I mean? That we can kind of say, this is the Stephen Clements room or this is, you know, somewhere we can put his name just so that his, his memory stays alive in that way. We're very quick to tell people to reach out and to talk to people about how they're feeling. But we haven't really addressed how to listen to somebody who does reach out to you. Because I've often wondered if Stephen had said to me, told me how he was feeling, how would I have reacted? How would I have handled that conversation? You know, and I think it's, it's really important that we, that we address that because it's very easy when somebody does tell you, um, like I'm, I'm, not, I'm not feeling myself or I'm not whatever, to almost make it about yourself and go and dismiss it and go, sure, what have you got to worry about? I go on, you'll be grand. And then you've, you've brushed away maybe like the gateway to a really important conversation. And I know those conversations are very awkward, especially if you don't know how to handle it. So I think we, need, we really need to, as a community, learn how to listen and how, whenever somebody does reach out like that, they're not looking for you to, to give them a solution or to fix something. They just want you to sit there and go, tell me how you feel. And it's not about why, it's about how do you feel? And it's about getting them through that moment of sort of that moment of, of, of bearing their soul to you and telling you their most darkest thought. And you just have to listen. And then you ring Lifeline or one of the, the helplines. And because they're the professionals. You, and, and you might feel awkward and be like, well, I, I don't know how to deal with this. I'm, I'm not a professional. And like, so shoot away. Don't do that. All you have to do is sit and listen. I think Stephen would want his legacy to be just beaming with positivity. 
that people remember and just how talented he was, but also um, how much he liked to help people because be it somebody who had just opened a cafe or a charity that needed a, a shout out or um, needed somebody to come and host something or whatever it was, he was always willing to do that. And he loved doing that. He really loved building people up. And I, th I think that that's what his legacy needs to be, just positivity and, um, and helpfulness.